All right, uh, I guess we'll get started here. So, kind of curious, uh, I know this is not really like a, a mobile conference, of one, uh, something that I typically attend, but I'm just curious, uh, how many of you uh, are currently mobile developers, developer iOS, Android, Windows, something mobile? Cool, it's about half of you guys. Excellent, and the rest of you are just kind of curious about how these mobile thingies work and uh, see how we do stuff in the, in, in the, with the new hotness these days, awesome. So cool. Well, thanks for, uh, for coming. I know I was a last minute fill in for somebody that uh, couldn't make it. So uh, thanks for coming to my session here. Um, so I am primarily a, an iOS developer and I've uh, been doing this for about five years now. Um, before they called it iOS, it was called iPhone OS. So there's that bit of trivia for you. Um, what, I, uh, what this talk is, is about mobile apps, but uh, more specifically, uh, let me turn that back on. Hello. Clicker, all right, ah, there we go, let's do this. All right, more specifically, this is about what we do in iOS and, and more of the, the way that the Cocoa frameworks work. If you've heard of uh, how things are built um, as far as the frameworks that we use, every, every platform has its own frameworks, and this is kind of how, how, um, how we do things in Cocoa. So it's, it should be helpful, it's still fairly, uh, it's specific as far as uh, some of the technologies and some of the code, uh, but the patterns are still very applicable to pretty much any platform and language that you want to, uh, to take it to. So hopefully it's useful. Uh, quick intro about me. I do a couple of things. Uh, I'm the, the panda here guy. So uh, I do a, my own consulting uh, with the Magical Panda. And I do a, a podcast uh, for iOS developers that the kids seem to like these days. It's called NS Brief. Uh, head to nsbrief.com. Check out uh, interviews with other developers that uh, do iOS as well. To see what the community is doing these days. It's pretty fun. So there's that. So I want to start off with kind of talking about um, a career that I, you know, about my career just in the beginning. You know, a long time ago, um, I was a, you know, a young programmer, Padawan, didn't know a whole lot. So um, I worked for a, a pretty evil corporation. Well, maybe not evil, but just a night, you know, I, I worked there. <laughs> That's okay. Um, they were cool. So one thing about working at a place like IBM is that um, there are a lot of neckbeards around, and they know a lot of stuff. I think I was there like maybe 15 years ago, and they had already been coding for at least 20. Uh, so this is you know a lot of knowledge there, and you, you learn a lot of stuff as as a young uh, young programmer. And you know, so I would ask these neckbeards, well, how do you do things? You know, how does the code that you write, uh, how is it so good? Um, you know, there's a lot of advanced techniques. You know, obviously, you know, you're, you you want to. You, know, you want to advance as, as fast as possible when you're, you're just a little young dude out of college. So one of the things that they gave me was this book on design patterns. It's a classic book. I'm sure most of you have seen this, have read it. Um, it's just, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff in this book is applicable today. Um, and I think a lot of the, the kids that do uh, mobile applications and a lot of other of the new techniques and languages and things, they don't really um, appreciate the content that's there because they're trying to reinvent the wheel. So, um, you know, this book changed my life in a lot of ways because after I read it, I, I saw a lot of patterns. They were everywhere. You know, if you, if you know where to look, there's patterns all over the place, right? You know, see colors and shapes and patterns and, you know, it's pretty, pretty easy. We're, we're programmery people. We can recognize patterns. And you saw Dave Thomas's talk. He talked about pattern recognition. Um, this one is a pretty good one. I like this one. Yeah, see, you guys pick it all up, right? See, if you have 2020 vision, you can see, you know, at the bottom. There's even, a, if, if you get the slides later, you can see it. If you can read this, you, your eyes are the elite in elite speak. It's pretty awesome. All right, so uh, the, rest of, uh, the rest of my normal joke goes, you know, I, I learned to uh, see patterns everywhere, and uh, eventually, you know, I, I got hired by the, you know, uh, the Secret Service to, to do stuff, and I eventually won a Nobel Prize in economics. Well, never mind. That didn't happen. Ah, but... What I did do was I did try to take, um, you know, I took that book and I, and I, you know, learned how, you know, some of, you know, the, the, the Gang of Four did stuff. And I also, as far as, as Coco and Objective-C work in, uh, uh, as far as iOS programming, we use a language called Objective-C. Um, and it's based on a lot of things um, uh, with Smalltalk. So Smalltalk is also a very influential book. And reading this has also changed uh, some of the way that I code. So... We have this book, and let's see how this thing works together with, with iPhone design. So, 
I'm an engineer, I'm a pretty practical guy, so let's kind of walk through this as far as building a, a real app, just kind of conceptually walking through this thing. And you know, um, in, the, in the old days of iOS, uh, we would build uh, Twitter clients. Twitter was the new hotness about the same time that iOS and iPhone OS um, was, uh, was gaining popularity. And it used to be we wrote Hello World apps with Twitter. But now we do it with app.net because Twitter hates developers. So what we want to do with is we want an app.net client that lets us post our statuses and list, um, you know, post stuff and list stuff and store stuff from the network. So you know, we want to put it on, on a device. So first thing, we want to display our stuff. So we have got a table view, it's a very simplistic uh, display mechanism to list all of the statuses. Uh, we need something that goes over to uh, the app.net service grab some data and pull it down. And we also need to represent that data locally and store it and cache it and do all those, those things. And you can probably see where I'm going with this because it's a very uh, similar pattern that you've seen everywhere all over the place, MVC. Now it turns out that MVC is something that we do a lot in uh, iPhone. Uh, the Coco frameworks are built somewhat around this thing, around the classic MVC, small talk version of MVC. But you, um, you're not exactly tied to this. You're free to kind of uh, weave stuff in and out. And I would say that not everything needs to fit in the MVC model paradigm world. You can have things going in and out. But you know, what we have here is just a really simple way to, to kind of conceptualize um, a few of the components. So obviously, we, well, let's, let's, let's talk about how we do MVC in, in Cocoa, right? So we'll start with, with all of our, our things, our parts here. So we'll start with the model. And especially, this will be good for, for those of you who aren't familiar with Xcode and things. Uh, we have uh, our model, and this is how we actually represent models. We have a tool called Core Data, and I talked about this yesterday a bit. But we can visually diagram and represent all of our data entities uh, with this tool. And what this tool will do, will do then, it will generate code behind the scenes that talks to the, our data store and our persistence mechanism. Now we can have, you know, as I mentioned yesterday, we can. Uh, store that data to an in-memory store or XML store or whatever. We have various ways to persist it, but that's not really uh, that's not really what matters. What matters is that we have objects that represent data, and they can, you know, as a side effect, they can be stored somewhere. So this is very useful for us. And we can. What's really useful here is that it's a it's a very simplified UML diagram. So if you've if you've seen this in other kind of uh, case tools uh, back in the day, uh, this should look very familiar. And I, and I use this a lot, and it's really nice to have. Uh, this reflect what my code is doing. So that's nice. So in a lot of times I'll write code like this and I'll have, uh, you know, just some really easy helper methods. Just, you know, just really simple things, concepts that you would do in, in code anyway. Let's talk about the view really quick. Um, views are generally, you know, obviously what's displayed on the screen. And we have another tool in Xcode uh, that's called Interface Builder. And what this thing does is it really just lets us uh, visually lay out our, our, our UI. Now, this thing uh, is, is, is interesting. This, this tool, per se, has been around for at least 20 years. Um, if you ever look at old Next videos, if you go to um, YouTube and search for uh, Steve Jobs and Next and introduction of, of the Next stuff and demos, uh, you'll see basically this exact tool being demoed in the mid-80s. It's, it was that ahead of its time. It was, it's really great. Um, and what this thing does is it lets us instantiate our views. So these are all actual view objects. We put them in a little file. We can visually represent them. And then we can hook up our views to our code. So we're basically, we've got a big giant visual dependency injection container that injects views um, and view instances to our actual controller instances. So that's kind of nice. And this is a really neat tool. I really, if, you, if you're curious about Xcode and, and Objective-C and iOS, this is another thing to really embrace and, and use that to its full potential. Now the controller is um, you know, um, a subject of debate as far as uh, iOS goes because um, a lot of people don't seem to know what goes in a controller because it could be almost anything. This is a very common paradigm in iOS, if you've ever seen this one. Uh, the, the joke for, for most iOS people is that you, f you open up view controllers and you basically have all your logic. This is like the only thing, the only class people seem to write code into, and that's not good. And, and that's where I, you know, I was trying to you know, uh, at least 
conceptualize the MVC stuff because there is a home for all the different pieces, the, all the different parts of, of your applications. There are different places to put it. Um, but again, they don't all have to fit into that MVC um, paradigm. You can have stuff, uh, communication channels go outside of that. And we'll talk about that in a minute here. So we've got, uh, we've got our concept of model view controllers. And, uh, you know, ideally, the way that we use these in iOS, the view controller is slightly different. Uh, we could have uh, different views kind of manipulating different layouts and different inputs and things so that we can have, you know, a whole collection of these view controllers manipulating the same data. But what we usually have is um, in our apps, we have all of these different things that we need to do. And what we, what we should be doing here is actually you know, trying to con you know, contain these things in little subsystems. This is what I'm trying to say is, as far as um, being able to think outside of the MVC box. You should have you know, controllers and things kind of have a reference to all these different services somehow and let these things kind of have their own kind of uh, uh, architecture things. And, and we, what we really want is some kind of uh, communication uh, channel. And that is not showing up at all. Wow, all right. All right, so we have our app. And let's, let's talk about like how, how uh, iOS apps in, in particular, and this is just general for Mac and iOS, because it's all about Cocoa, um, how they're structured uh, in general. So first of all, we start off with something called an app delegate. You know, we, 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 we have a, so, so objective C is built on top of C, so we have something in the C area of code go ahead and build a class called an app delegate. And uh, what this does is basically pr provides us with our starting point. This is our main function and our main class. So we start there. And what we do there is we build up the window and we build up the display and we have something called a root view controller. And this is basically the, the first view controller of, of our uh, application's hierarchy. This is something that will control what's displaying on the screen. So there's that. And what we can do is we'll generally have, you know, another view controller because we need to display more details, right? We've only got a small screen full of information, so we'll need to, you know, maybe create another one that displays a different screen full of information. And then we'll create another one. And we'll create another one. And eventually, you know, just like the whole massive view controller paradigm, we get more view controllers uh, in our system. And these things get really hard to control. And we also find that some of these view controllers are tightly coupled. I think there was uh, somebody's talk yesterday was talking about... Um, how you know, things can get really coupled, and that was a bad thing just by, oh, it was Ben's. Ben's talk was talking about uh, using a, a tool to actually analyze your dependencies between view controllers, and that's, that's really not a good thing where you have basically cyclical dependencies. So we don't want to do that kind of thing. That thing. What we want to do is we want to have something on our, our mythical app.net service here. We want to have that just on the app delegate. Now, the reason we put it there is because uh, we have this app delegate that lives for the life of our application. So that, that's not controlled by us per se, because uh, we don't instantiate, we can instantiate new view controllers, but the app delegate is basically a system controlled, um, well, it's a system controlled object, a system controlled instance, but it's effectively a singleton that's you, you know, controlled by the system. So that thing will live for the life of the application. So if we want our application to be center, centered around this you know, uh, remote service, we, we want that to kind of live in something that lives for the life of the app. So what we want is, well, how do we get from one of these view controllers down here uh, up to something up here that's basically disconnected? So what a lot of people do in, in Objective-C, and uh, you know, those of you who already write Objective-C uh, might see this uh, pretty commonly, is uh, you, you take that singleton that we said, that app delegate, we have this UA application is the singleton, and then we get the delegate off of that application. So these are just nested method calls. Um, don't be afraid of the square brackets. Uh, it doesn't hurt that much. Um, and then we cast it, and then we use that. And that's, this is a pretty common paradigm. And people make it worse by using uh, the C preprocessor and making a shortcut by saying, well, it's a shared app delegate. Great, that works. Uh, you know, so what I want to say is stop doing that. You know, for all the Objective-C people in the, in the crowd, don't do that, because every time you do that, you kill a puppy. Please don't do that. The puppy's so sad. All right, so what do we want to do instead, right? So we have these view controllers down here, and what we have is we have something called a message. And I'll get to what that is in a second. And we want to 
you go, you know, we basically want to go up the chain. And we have these reverse links, and we can send a message all the way up the chain, up to the top, and then that thing can just go and do its thing, right? So that sounds pretty simple to do, and we have this pattern that this follows. And this, is, this pattern is built into the um, UI kit and app kit uh, frameworks. It's called the chain of responsibility. Uh, in, in Coco, it's called the responder chain. Now, what we can do, then, so how we send something up the responder chain is using this method call. Now, if you're not familiar with Objective-C, this is actually one line of code, so don't worry about that. Um, and this is actually one method. So uh, these colons are just uh, you know, parameter delimiters. And uh, so the name of this method is send action to from event. To from for event, sorry. And uh, what this does is it sends, so the application, this UI application deal is the thing that, that controls the UI run loop, the thing that, that, that basically loops over and over to take events from the system and pass them on, uh, pass those events on to your objects and to all of your view controllers and your views and all that stuff. So we're basically injecting a new event into that loop on the next iteration of the loop so that it can go and, and pass along that event up the chain. So that's pretty simple. Another example of something that's pretty common on iOS is dismissing the keyboard. If you've ever used an iPad or an iPhone, uh, you, you probably see that you touch away and you have to, some apps will, will let you touch away from a text field input and the keyboard hides. Right? You would think that that's a, kind of a hide keyboard method or something like that, but what you're actually trying to do is resign the first responder. The first responder is the thing that accepts the input at that particular point, and when you resign it, it says, well, um, by default, the keyboard comes for text fields. If you resign it, uh, it means I'm not the first responder, so the keyboard's going to slide away. The system knows how to do this. But what a lot of people do is they'll, they'll loop over their view hierarchy because they'll know that the, the responder is in there somewhere, and they'll do this recursive thing to find their first responder and try to resign it. Because that's what this thing is doing. Find and resign first responder. So we do this and it tells us yes or no if it did that. But there's actually a single line of code that you can replace this with. And, and you, you don't want to do this. This is, this is a different joke. So we have this. We have our keyboard. slides up. And we use this one line of code. Again, this is just one line of code. We send an, a message. And our message is this selector thing. So we send a selector. So that says resign the first responder, and what this does is it'll go, the system will already know who the first responder is, and it'll go and send that message to that, that object, and it'll resign the keyboard, and it goes away. One line of code if you know how the things work. So that's fairly simple. The only caveat to this is that this method, or this way of working, needs to happen in uh, the view did appear method of a view controller, or, did, or in this method or after, right? So the, the reason this works is, you know, we've got kind of a, a, a kind of a link of, of the, our view hierarchy. So we've got the app delegate is part of the responder chain, the root view controllers, and any view controllers are part of the responder chain, and so are our views. So we've got all of that here. Now what happens in, in uh, before view did appear is it's not part of that responder chain. So if we, if we put it in here, it's going to actually go off the end of the chain that it already knows about, and then it's going to go nowhere. It's not going to go to the right place. So we have to wait for it to be connected for, for this responder trick to actually work correctly. So that's something to keep in mind when you're using that. One of the other things that we do in iOS apps pretty commonly is networking. And a lot of the, uh, one of the frameworks that the, that the kids use these days is called AF networking. Uh, this is a, a pretty popular library. Um, it, it makes creating and receiving networking calls um, and, a cap, and it uh, makes those easier. It also does a lot of pre-processing, so if you have basically binary data come back and it's actually a JSON blob, it'll deserialize the JSON and put it in a nice data structure for you. So it does a lot of work for you. It's really nice. Wow, that code shows up pretty horribly on this projector. Uh, so the, the actual code doesn't really matter too much. It's really kind of the shape, which is, again, showing up terribly. But down here, there's, there's a whole lot of code that says this is all that's happening in the view did load method. So I want to zoom this up, up here a bit. And, uh, well, we've got a whole bunch of other code, and we've got some AF JSON stuff going on in here. We've got a whole lot of different things. So I'm going to zoom in on this part here as well. So hopefully, I think this is a little easier to read. And what this tells me is that all that stuff was in a view controller. It was in the view did load method. Now, to me, it's also uh, ca capturing way too many things in the request. So we have our, our data area right here. We've got 
some kind of view stuff going on here. And this uh, networking thing is also kind of part of this controller thing that should also maybe be outside of a, into another controller. So we've got a lot of things happening in this one small uh, snippet of code. So if we think about it, right? So what we want to do when we send stuff across the network, we want to send it to a service. In this case, it's an app.net service. And what we really need to do is we need to send it to a particular URL because we're using a RESTful API. We have some kind of web requests. And so what we have is we also have, as part of the API for an app.net, is that we have uh, these post variables, those parameters that we need to set. So rather than just saying, well, we have some kind of URL, I'd rather just give it some kind of mental moniker, you know, mental mnemonic, so that I know what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get the personal stream in this particular case. And what I also want to do is I want to set these things as parameters on that particular thing that I'm trying to do. Now, rather than doing that, what I can do instead is convert those parameters into properties and convert this personal stream guy over here to a class. And now what I can do is I can encapsulate all of the logic that I need uh, into a class and not worry that it's going across an HTTP uh, communication channel. I can just create an instance of this command, set the properties that I want, and then the command can go in and do the processing as far as converting my, you know, my intention from an object standpoint into the HTTP stuff. So this kind of hides some stuff. And we also have stuff in our, on our app.net service so that uh, we can configure it, we can create a test version of it if we want, and uh, have a, a, you know, a test URL for all these commands to go to. So what we can do is basically we say that I, I want to get that personal stream object and then send it off to the service and then the service goes and deals with it. Now this pattern is called the command pattern. It's also very common in there. Um, a lot of people will also call it the service action pattern. Um, but you also notice that we have in that uh, class template uh, something called an ADN command. I had, uh, created a base class because we had get personal stream command as a subclass of an app.net command. Uh, and we have that here. So it turns out that when you start using this pattern, you, you create a lot of different commands. You could, you know, this is only a, a subset of what you could do uh, with the app.net API. And what we end up doing is we have that base class command, uh, base class app.net command to do all the stuff that's specific for app.net type of operations. And what that tends, ends up being is a template. So what we can have is we have uh, some really simple like generating the request kind of things in that base class. And then we can have stuff that's specific, specific for app.net. And then we're also filling in the blanks underneath in each of those subcommands as far as anything that's very specific for that particular action that we're trying to perform. Uh, the template pattern is another one of those classic patterns, and it's uh, something that's fairly easy to use. It's really just subclassing and, and making your subclasses uh, make sense. Um, I like to think about it as Mad Libs. Uh, just fill in the blank and make sure you um, insert human stroke here. Um, so there's that. Um, and the way that we do that in code, and I know this code is, is uh, not showing up on this projector very well, uh, but the way that we would do this in Objective-C, so we have our app delegate up here, and we have a little web service reference here. And the way that we connect our app.net or whatever service to another uh, object is we say, well, return the web service as a next responder. So this connects it to that, that responder chain uh, so that when we pass those messages, it can go, goes all the way up to this service uh, thing. Uh, and then we have a web service, and we can send it a command uh, through the web service so we can pass it as a parameter, and we can perform certain actions and things. So one of the things that we do with the web service command that's pretty common is log in and log out. So we have a couple of commands, these actions here. So we, we can, with, with these, what this IB action lets us do is connect a button tap or any other gesture or something, some kind of action from that UI builder tool, the, the interface builder. Uh, we can connect that from the visual tool to the actual code just by dragging and dropping this connection. So it'll wire this up uh, via that tool. And that's kind of nice. And what we can do is we have these uh, actions here that we can just send. And what we do in that action, so that comes from the, uh, the, uh, an actual button tap on the UI. And that will go ahead and trigger the creation of this command. And then we just say, hey, command, go up to the chain. And, and you know, I've written uh, some really uh, simple code here as far as just setting some settings. But what the command send does, it'll just 
it's a nice shorthand method for uh, injecting this thing up the responder chain and sending it up to the web service. Now, if we look at the login code from the view controller, we can see that this code doesn't deal with any data stuff and login stuff and network stuff. The view controller deals with the view and it only controls the view. And it also has a login action that is also sent from the same button tap. And it says, well, you know, is, is the password valid? Otherwise, you know, re do some first responder resignation and do some, do some visual stuff. And this all happens only in the view. And what the other thing is, is that we have uh, the username and the password uh, that's hooked up. So when we create that command, uh, we get that from the view controller so that uh, the view controller knows how the UI is structured so it can return the username and password from the way the view is structured. Uh, so, so we can get it directly from the view, but we really don't care how the view works because there's that separation where the command uh, is just getting an answer to a question and the view knows the details. So this is kind of a nice way to separate things. Uh, a couple other things, like I said, we have the send command uh, helper method, and this is where we hook into AF networking. What we do is we say, hey command, you're configured now, now I need some kind of a request operation. I need to generate the URL request and all that stuff, and then send it off its merry way uh, to go happen on the network. And what this thing does is it just has some more, you know, like it has some template code that it knows to ask the subclass to fill in the details, and it generates a request so that we can send it off of the HTTP client from AF networking, and then off it goes onto the network, and things kind of get handled that way. So it's nice in that a lot of this stuff has a home. Uh, the web service knows how to deal with the web stuff, and the command, the command pattern really isolates and can encapsulates all the things that we, we want for that particular operation. Uh, so yeah, we have a few things here that are really uh, useful as far as displaying uh, information, uh, a really common pattern in Objective-C is the delegate pattern, so we have a delegate. Uh, a delegate is kind of like um, the, the template pattern, but it's more of an instance-to-instance thing and rather, uh, rather than a super class, base class kind of deal. So we have a delegate and we want to send a message to a delegate and we just kind of say, we don't care what it is, we can just send any, any message that we want. Uh, so we can do that here. And again, we've got our, our queuing operation, which does that. So, you know, what we, ha we end up having is we have this command object, and that turns into a request, right? So it goes to our service, becomes a request, and then what happens is from the, from the service, we get some kind of response, and the web service is also um, responsible for creating uh, some kind of usable object, something that's useful for us to, um, to decipher as, um, as Objective-C objects. So we take this usable object, and what we want to do is it's basically data at that point. So what we do here is we, we take our, our object, convert it to data, and what we want to do is we want to display that data. So we don't do it directly. We don't just say, here's a blob of JSON, convert it to a dictionary, and display that in the, in the view. Uh, what we want to do is we want to save that to something like a core data store. Um, and so what we want to do is say, well, we've got our data store. We're going to store our data in there, and then as uh, you know, an MVC kind of paradigm, we're going to say, well, from the model, we're going to notify the view that stuff is available. And that's where this NSFetch results controller comes in. So it's using, uh, it's doing some stuff here to uh, set up the fetch results controller. Uh, uh, it's really fairly straightforward, uh, exactly what this line says. And we use the delegate to get more delegate stuff there. So delegation, like I said, is a really useful pattern. Uh, it tells us, it basically, basically gives us uh, some callbacks and event, uh, event notifications for very specific instances of uh, things that we're looking for. Um, in this case, uh, when a new object is available in our data source. So again, like I said, it's, uh, it's kind of an abstract kind of template. Uh, instead of doing subclasses, it's more of a side-by-side -side kind of deal. So it's, it's really more of a, of a helper. So with our NSFetch results controller, delegate uh, protocol, we have a few methods that we need to implement. So if you're not familiar with Objective-C, a protocol is basically like an interface in uh, Java or C Sharp. Um, we have basically method definitions that we need to uh, implement. And these are a few that we need to implement on our fetch results controller delegate. Now these methods will signify, hey, I'm about to change the data, and here's the data change, and then uh, I did change content. So this is a before, during, and after data change. And we can uh, implement it this way. Um, 
again, a little bit hard to, it's hard to read, but what we can say is, well, we got an update, so we're going to uh, reload the data there. Um, if we got to move, we can, re we can move stuff. Uh, otherwise, here we can delete it and insert. So we can handle all of our CRUD operations visually that happened in the data source. So the data source and the delegate says, well, here's all the things that changed and here's how they changed and we can respond exactly how we need to in the view to basically reflect all those changes visually. So that kind of happens. This is very boilerplate code as well. This is actually Apple sample code except for uh, these green lines of code. So it's a very common thing, common way to do this in, in, uh, uh, in Objective-C. And this under the covers is using, using the observer pattern uh, because we're watching the data store. So we can kind of take now a, a fresh look at uh, what model view controller means. Um, so we can say it's actually composed of a few patterns. We've got you know, this command, the observer pattern, we use the composite pattern, mediator, strategy. You know, all these patterns are, are there and they're just all bundled together. So you're kind of using them without even knowing. So the way that I, you know, just one, other way to kind of re reiterate, I guess, the event handling in the way that Objective-C, Coco, iOS apps work is that we have kind of this touch interface at the top, so that's kind of representing the glass screen, and we've got all the views, view controllers, all these things, and what we do is, you know, when we touch, the touch gets handled by the first view, and it gets handled by the view controller, and then eventually makes its way up to the app delegate, and in this case, we're sending it off to app.net, and then we you know, send it off to the cloud, the internet handles things somewhere, and it comes back the other side in our data store and eventually gets handled by the view controller and the view and, and all that gets back. And we you know, re reflect that, that touch back in our UI. So uh, it's a very circular kind of interaction where you, you push it down, something happens, it goes off on one end and the, uh, the response from a network kind of comes back on the other end and we save the changes and try to reflect those with our fetch results controller. Uh, that way. So one thing about patterns is they're pretty easy to abuse. Uh, one is uh, factories. Uh, I think this is fairly common in, in things like Java, static languages like Java and C Sharp, um, because you end up with uh, miniature models of factories and you know factories that make more factories, and it's just like it just becomes a combinatorial explosion of other factory builder types of, of patterns. So in Objective-C, we do something slightly different. We have a two-phase creation, uh, which uh, if you're not familiar with it, again, it, it's probably a little weird. Uh, first, we allocate a, an instance of our class, and then we initialize it. Now this has, um, so this means that what we can do is kind of use this method here. This is a C function, so NS class from string, uh, to basically create our class from basically a string. So instead of having factory patterns, we have a factory method that says, well, I'm gonna create an instance of a class. I'm just, actually, I'm not even creating an instance. I'm creating the class based on this string name. It's kind of weird. And we can do weird stuff like this. We can say, create a class from a string and then alloc and init that guy. Well, hopefully, uh, this class exists. So otherwise, you'll get null. And if you get null or nil, uh, this will actually do nothing. But what we can do is, since we're doing uh, a two-phase creation, we can separate out the actual creation and uh, construction of the class, basically just doing string parsing, and the init is much more of a, we can init that wherever we need to. So because we're doing things in two phases, we don't necessarily, in Objective-C anyway, need to do something like uh, a factory pattern. We can more or less use something like uh, creating an instance of a class dynamically based on uh, particular string inputs and things. And it's maybe how you build the string might be something that's also a little bit more uh, involved, but uh, as far as the actual like you know, uh, con you know, abstract factory of this other thing, we don't really use that very much. The other thing that I see abused a lot are singletons. Um, I do not necessarily like singletons. They are uh, pretty bad. Uh, for one, they have uh, global state, so they're fancy global variables and uh, wide shared states. Um, for one thing is that you're not always sure of when singletons die. And yeah, so that, that it's just hard to control. Now singletons are useful for things that are long lived 
or have a complicated setup or are actually a shared resource like on the phone, on the device, you only have one camera, right? You only have one screen and in some cases you have two screens when you're using AirPlay, but there are certain cases where singletons do make sense. But I think it's really our usage of singletons that, that is the problem. And you know, that's the thing is like, there's always that one person in the back that says uh, singletons are the awesome. So um, let's go through an example of kind of how to properly use singletons in Objective-C. So in Objective-C we have, this is one of our singletons. We have our NS user defaults, standard user defaults. Uh, this is a singleton that lets us uh, store user properties for a particular application. The system will go ahead and store these in a secret place. Well, somewhat secret, but basically a place that you don't care about and the application can manage basically user preferences in a nice little dictionary with this guy. So there's that. Um, and what I would propose instead is to reference that user defaults using a property in your class, wherever you're using it, instead of just you know, using the user defaults, standard defaults uh, call within your classes, inject it as an external dependency as a property somehow. Um, and you can do that here. Now that's very simple, so you just use it like that. Now the benefit to doing it this way is you get to do something like this. And again, I'll, I'll post the slides here so that you can see, these, see the code a little bit better. But what's nice about this is that what we can also do is watch changes to a particular property on the user def defaults. So we've got a couple of really nice properties about this particular code is that we can say, well, enable visual settings so we can watch for that key to change. And what we wanna do is take advantage of a couple of things. One is that we have this nice setter so we can use this syntax, it, it gets translated into this set user defaults method. So we can change the default behavior of that one to something that suits us. So what we can do is take advantage of, of the, the nil property of messaging nil in Objective-C. So we don't need to nil check that we have something here in this underscore user defaults instance variable. If it's nil, nothing will happen in that, in that first line here. And what we can say is, well, remove observer with all this stuff. So we don't, so we can say we're gonna, we're gonna unobserve the, the last, the old value of that, of that property is gonna unobserve that key path. Uh, we're gonna now change the value and now we're gonna say, well, this has the new value here and now we're gonna observe this setting. So now what we can do is say, basically this lets us uh, observe and unobserve very simply by either setting this property to an instance of the user defaults of, of course there's only uh, one, or we can say, we can basically turn off the observation by setting this property to nil, right? So we also have this, uh, this context thing. So this is a important thing in Objective-C when you're doing KVO. Um, I think most of you are not uh, gonna do this part, so I'm gonna leave this alone, but that was the, the proper way to implement a KVO method if you're, if you're curious, so I'll put those slides up there. Um, so we've talked about a few patterns today, and they're, those are the ones that I really have kind of stressed today. Um, but you can see there's quite a few. This is a pretty old, old deal. But you know, the secret is that these are pretty generic things. They're, they're just, they're just patterns that you know any application, mobile or not, can use. So it's not, it's not anything that's specific to mobile. So, but I would still strongly recommend you know looking at these. Um, let's see, there are, well, I think I should have skipped this particular slide here with the books. So the thing is, like, what's old is new again. There, you know, there are, we're, we're, mobile is still the new hotness. There's still a lot of new things to be discovered about mobile applications, right? So there are still patterns that are yet to be discovered, patterns that have different implications than just being structural or computationally correct or you know, things like that, that that help in architecture. Uh, there are patterns that maybe relate to battery power, right? Mobile is highly dependent on the life of a battery. So it could be that somebody here, somebody anywhere, will uh, develop an algorithm that is not only computationally correct, but you know, power efficient. And that's something to, to think about. So you know, we also need to think about uh, transmitting data across a wireless signal, right? This is directly related to the battery. So in that case, we need to also think about patterns that may arise when we're accessing the network. Well, how do we group these things together to be more efficient? Now, Apple has taken care of a lot of these things for us um, by trying to 
uh, automatically take the API calls and group them into a, a single network fire or single radio uh, turn on signal and fire a cluster of of network requests and then turn it off. They're trying to help you solve these problems. At least uh, that's kind of what, what I get with their, with their um, uh, sessions about power management and such. Concurrency patterns are also something that's, that are there. You, know, we, you see there's a lot of talk here at this conference about functional languages and functional paradigms. But uh, as we go into more um, uh, you know, multi-core processors, see the iPhone these days is dual core. You know, my Mac is quad cores. You know, uh, the Mac Pro is like 16 cores. Concurrency patterns are, are more, pa are, you know, more patterns that are yet to be discovered. Uh, we have a few of those in, uh, in Objective C uh, for GCD, which is our Grand Central Dispatch, which is kind of the unit of work, which is a really simple uh, concurrency um, pattern to use. So one such pattern that um, that we can use, that we can kind of leverage, that has come emerged, I guess, from from iOS programming and such, is uh, the cache, a dictionary, right? So we have things like caching, and we what we also need to do though is hook up a cache or a dictionary to memory warning. So if, um, in an embedded environment such as an iPhone where we have limited availability of resources like memory and CPU and things, we occasionally need to dump that stuff uh, from uh, memory to make room for the rest of the system. Now this is already built in to Objective-C and Cocoa. It's called NS Cache. And what we can do is say, well, you know, we can just set our limiters and set our properties as to what qualifies as uh, a cache event that needs to be dumped. So NS Cache will already listen for those low memory warning events and dump data for you. So you don't have to worry about that. So this is just a, a system example of these patterns that you know, basically build on other patterns. So we have the dictionary pattern is pretty common and we just basically automatically hook it up to, um, to, the, to the memory warning and we kind of get that to work. The other, another uh, pattern that might be uh, something that uh, is something that, is, uh, that crops up a lot in iOS uh, applications is reachability. So um, a lot of times what you'll be doing is you'll, you'll, you'll be uh, using your app you know, in a nice place like this where we have some pretty decent Wi-Fi or you know, you've got a really nice cell signal and uh, you've got great reachability. But a lot of times what you have is actually something where it's you know, very, very bad. And what you want to do is respond to those differences in network conditions and change dynamically the way that your app behaves uh, based on different network conditions. Now a lot of people will do if-else kinds of things like if, if network uh, reachability is good, then do this. If we're on a LAN, do that. But what you can do instead is use a strategy pattern to uh, swap out the implementations at runtime. Objective-C is very dynamic, so you can just say, well, um, you, you use the strategy and you use observer pattern to say, hey, I've got a new reachability state. I'm only able to get to, you know, I only have you know, 100K of bandwidth. Well, use this other network strategy to uh, download some, you know, to, to, to connect to the network in a different way. Or maybe you have something that says, well, it only, you know, it will only grab you know, the, the, the least amount of data uh, capable of displaying some information, right? So uh, the least amount of data required, you, you just swap out to that implementation versus the one with the high bandwidth. You go and grab everything, get all the, ca all the images, all the caches, and all that stuff. So um, in iOS, we have this as, as something called the reachability. There's a reachability API, and there are open source classes that build on top of this to make this actually easier to use. So that's something to, to look at and think about as well. Um, and as far as concurrency patterns, we have something that uh, Apple has introduced to us in a, a couple years ago uh, when they uh, introduced the uh, Grand Central Dispatch uh, method of APIs, um, the call callback pattern. So typically what you're going to do is you have uh, blocks. And blocks are like lambdas, closures. Uh, they let you run things or encapsulate a uh, you know, a, a simple um, body of, of, of execution. So what we have here is we have a, a method and then we do something in the background and then we, we uh, do a completion block. So um, what we also have is uh, we have uh, an asynchronous method on our completion handler. So from the, uh, from the inside, we have this thing that does something in the background and at the very end, it'll call back um, to the completion handler, the block. Right? 
in the calling method of this sum async method, it will say, well, in the completion handler, now also call to the main method and do, do something there. So we, we also have these, this nice API to do um, basically thread joining um, so that it's not so complicated. Each, each call to this dispatch async is basically a thread boundary. So it's very easy in the code, at least, at least a lot easier than it used to be, to see where thread boundaries are. You just, every time you have an async, a dispatch async, you go to a different thread. And in this case, it's going to the main queue. And in this case, we're going to some kind of background queue over here. So uh, this is a fairly common pattern. Also, you'll see a lot in Objective-C code if you uh, decide to take that plunge. So, you know, I'll just kind of finish up with a couple of uh, things about design patterns. Uh, the usefulness of design patterns is that there are basically a menu of choices that you have when you're designing your apps. You can just pick off a list of you have a certain problem, uh, a certain um, you know, problem space, and you can kind of look down the menu and say, well, does, you know, do I need a whole bunch of commands or do I need a whole bunch of subclasses or you know, I'm trying to fit these two things together, how does this, these objects relate? And you can kind of look down that menu and say, well, this one uh, fits this, this, this pattern fits this problem that I'm trying to solve and, and really do that. But it's also a great communication mechanism between developers. As long as you have that vocabulary, um, you can kind of start speaking uh, you know, on, on higher, higher level terms as far as patterns go. So, um, you know, it can also speed development if you've already, you know, basically you have a problem that, a pattern that solves the problem fairly completely. Um, you, you don't have to spend too many extra cycles trying all these different experiments that one pattern works or it doesn't work. You know, if you know that you need to do a traversal, you can probably, you know, look at the visitor pattern as, as something that you do. Or if you need to have this complex uh, dynamic tree of, of objects or something that you create, you know, look at the composite pattern and, and, and the builder pattern uh, associated with that. You know, you can, you can speed up at least a little bit of your design work and just, you know, kind of skip right to implementations because you've already got examples of how these, these patterns work. And, and they're proven to work. They've, they've worked for the last, you know, 20 years at least, so. So yeah, so well anyhow, that's a design pattern for mobile apps. Hopefully um, that helps you out, so thanks. Are there questions? I think we have time for questions. No? All right, thanks. <laughs>